I guarantee you, if you walk into any pet shop in Australia, the resident galah will be talking about microeconomic policy. <laughs> There's no need to fear a recession in any sense. Unemployment has jumped to its highest level for 12 months. It'll be a soft landing because we're seeing in last week's figures that great switch in the economy. It's an absolute commitment uh, that uh, I will lead the party into the next election with the intention of uh, leading the party through the whole of that term. Mr. Hawke, are we in a recession? Well, t technically, no, and I'm not trying to avoid your question, but... Unemployment in November jumped to its highest level for more than seven years. I frankly feel that uh, by Bob Hawke and others, I was treated as a bit of a glue merchant in the place, you know, when uh, it was bordering on instability because I, I kept saying there were very depressing messages from out there. The seasonally adjusted drop in employment is the biggest since December 1982. In response to these arguments, essentially one was just derided as an economic illiterate and put down. Treasurer, surely these national account figures uh, show that Australia is on the brink of a recession. Oh, no, not at all, Paul. Not at all. In fact, they, they, this is a beautiful set of numbers for us. For policy, this is a beautiful set of numbers. But, you know, trying to tell Paul anything has always been a very difficult task. Trying to tell him he's wrong is well nigh impossible. So I tried a lot of times, but I, I don't think I, I got through much. Talk about the roaring 20s, but the roaring 80s were unbelievable. Credit growth, 20% a year in Australia for the last three years of the 80s. Twice the growth in the economy, pushing up the price of assets. In the late 1980s, greed was like a contagious disease, blinding all who came near. Entrepreneurs, banks, bureaucrats, treasurers, prime ministers. Hawke and Keating ignored the warnings of colleagues and friends in favour of the Reserve Bank and Treasury, the so-called official family of advisers. The boardroom of the Reserve Bank of Australia is in keeping with the dignity of the institution. It is a setting for the quiet, objective efficiency of the nation's leading economic and financial advisors. I think we, were, we let ourselves down with bad staff work. We didn't identify the problems uh, early enough. We didn't uh, notice what was happening. And by the time that we realised that that was the case, which is getting into 1988, uh, and started to tighten interest rates, we'd had nine months or so of the economy racing away. Now, that was a lost period that in retrospect, in retrospect was fairly costly. The fact that interest rates were kept too low uh, during uh, late 1987 and most of 1988 meant that the economy overheated. The consequences of that overheating were that we had a large spillover of demand into imports, which exacerbated our balance of payments problem and our foreign debt problem, also exacerbated our inflation problem, and particularly uh, asset prices got out of hand. The boom got bigger and bigger and bigger, and it was clear that uh, everyone had misjudged the extent of the boom. And it was clear that the place was still running on faster and faster, even though we were putting interest rates up. So in the end, interest rates were pushed up quite sharply. The last increase, I think, was May, June of 89. 
when it actually did do the trick. You could actually feel it, something snapped. Today is the treasurer perhaps appropriately prepared to fly out to Paris. Interest rates shot up to a level not even speculated about last month. A new record of 17%. We made things too easy at the end of 87 and through 88. And, and so that when we did um, start to, to make the correction, they had to be made tougher and longer than they would otherwise have been. That was a mistake. That correction had to come. And when it came, it came with a vengeance. Now, of course, governments wear the responsibility for that. I've worn a lot of the responsibility for that. You just don't want to move. <sighs> of course I want to move. And then we will move when we save a bit more. That's what you always say? When we see a house we can afford, we'll do something about it. Promise. Think you can't afford a home of your own? Well, you can. Welcome to the beautiful, affordable Buckingham. Brutal interest rates would destroy the Australian dream of home ownership. With an election due in 1990, the government was looking all but dead. Some ministers wanted to help struggling home buyers. Keating scorned them. Interest rates were not even discussed in Cabinet. Monetary policy per se was hardly ever discussed at Cabinet. General economic policy was very rarely discussed at Cabinet. It was at a situation which was set up by Keating, I believe. I also believe that one of the reasons that uh, he engineered it that way was that Paul, deep down, always recognised that his conceptual grasp of economic issues was weaker than Ralph Willis's. And in a serious cabinet discussion, that would become apparent. Well, it certainly wasn't uh, something that normally came before cabinet. Um, it didn't require legislation or anything like that. It was essentially left uh, to uh, the, uh, the Prime Minister and Treasurer to conduct. But of course, uh, the rest of us uh, you know, were aware of what was going on. We can't say that, that we couldn't have raised the issue had we uh, wished to do so. I'd like, I'd like the guy to read out his slogan there on the 60% slogan. Could you read it out and make sure that the television cameras see it all around Australia? Can you afford, can you afford 60% of your income? Can you afford for your mortgage. <laughs> Through 89, I was very concerned because we ran the risk of alienating everyone who owned a home in Australia. And my, the view that I put to Hawke was that if we were going to keep interest rates that high and not be able to show some sort of reduction, then we'd have to have a policy to help those on, uh, on mortgages. Yeah, this period, and sort of from March 89 onwards, was an exceptionally crazy period by any standards. We had everybody doubting all the policy settings. I mean, they were feeling the heat of the interest rates, slowing the economy up. And we had people talking about re-regulation and uh, how deregulation had been a mistake. Any, any proposition that came up about uh, um, well, was reducing interest rates more quickly or other pro propositions about make-work programs and so on, my view was they should be looked at just as the same as I had that view before. And of course, you know, it came from doubts, you know, there's this sort of, you know, I think Bob had doubts about the public, the, the government's public position and whether we could survive. So he was entertaining some of these things. He was entertaining all these things. Well, of course, again, this is another antithesis of leadership thing. You could say, look, we've got the policy there and we're sticking with it. So while ever it be known that he was prepared to entertain schemes, of course they ran wild with them. I don't think Paul was ever terribly interested during 1989 in propositions to save uh, homeowners affected by 18% mortgages uh, or to save uh, business investment. I guarantee you if you walk into any pet shop in Australia, the resident Galar will be talking about microeconomic policy. <laughs> In a speech at Sydney's Menzies Hotel in June 1989, Keating heaped ridicule on those who favoured interest rate relief schemes. You can be confident that in the face of persistent economic circumstances, the government will continue to maintain its discipline and its steadfastness. But above all else, think clearly and not be spooked by some of the economic ratbaggery abounding at the moment. But I said to go into sort of tricked up policy, what I call embroidery, I started to use this embroidery phrase, phrase, 
the things on the embroidery rather than the fabric, we'll make a grave mistake. And that speech did call the crazy game to order. Keating, uh, in a, I suppose what he thought was a clever way, uh, cynically referred to embroidery. Well, it was a fairly absurd sort of statement, I think, in the sense that any sort of proposals are worth looking at. I think the Menzies Hotel speech in the middle of 89 had the same impact on the government as the Laws interview had had in 86. Not with the same media noise, but it really said, look, the government has a policy, it's the right policy, we're not going to change, we're not into rinky-dink solutions, we're not having a bar of them. Keating would be ferocious. But, you know, Paul is a ferocious person, so uh, it wouldn't matter whether it was about interest rates or two flies climbing up a wall. If you were disagreeing with him about which fly to support, he'd, he could get pretty angry pretty quickly. And he, he has an intimidatory style, which he uses very well. In Cabinet, he used brilliantly. So uh, th that's part of the, the Keating way of doing things. It's not, it doesn't simply represent the depth of a commitment to high interest rates. It represents a commitment to authority and the way it's exercised. Interest rates were scorching the earth, nowhere more than in rural communities notions of an idyllic rustic life were already a joke for Australia's farmers. They not only had to face crippling interest rates, they had been caught for years in a vicious trade war between Europe and America. We have a, a, an export enhancement program, derisively referred to by some as EAP, and uh, the, the program was originated to counter some of the practices, protection practices of Europe. There were times when that program adversely affected Australia's interest. So it was my job as president to be sure that the Australian leaders, first Bob Hawke, now Keating, uh, understood that we weren't aiming that program at Australia. They were able, obviously, to understand our arguments, see the cause of our concern. Uh, they gave soothing words and how they'd examine uh, the position and do what they could uh, to uh, save adverse impacts from occurring on, upon Australia. But uh, it continued to happen. So it was right through this period a source of very considerable tension. We're down in the trenches battling the European community over export subsidies and we had economic missiles flying back and forth between Brussels and uh, Washington DC. It was almost inevitable that every now and then one of those missiles would land in Canberra uh, or someone else, somewhere else around the world. And so that was happening from time to time and, and uh, all we could really say was we were sorry about that. That's not our intent. Uh, we'd like to avoid it. We'll do our best uh, to avoid it. Uh, but he, uh, but uh, from time to time that's uh, inevitably going to occur. But um, I had some difficulty explaining to Australian friends that it wasn't aimed at them because frankly it hurt Australia at times. And again on Bob Hawke, uh, he'd lean, lean on me. I mean he'd say wait a minute and he'd be um, ferocious in advocating the free trade Australian position. Squeezed between America and Europe, Australia had to develop some political leverage. It rather sticks in the gullets of Australians when we remember that on two occasions in this century, when these countries of Europe have been threatened in war with extinction, Australia and New Zealand have been immediately forthcoming with sending our resources immediately to them when they have been faced by the reality of war. Now they are imposing a trade war upon us. Australia's initial approach in 1986 was to form the Cairns Group, a coalition of free trade countries, which the Americans now maintain was their idea. 
Uh, I can recall discussions with uh, John Dawkins about that time in which I, in essence, said to, to John, yeah, the problem uh, that you folks in Australia and New Zealand have uh, is that you have no allies who are working with you. Uh, and an alliance uh, of uh, Australia, New Zealand, and a number of third world countries would really be helpful in this picture. Uh, and that's really perhaps uh, what started this off. Uh, well, that's a novel interpretation. Um, it is true that I spoke to uh, my counterpart at the time, the American uh, Mr. Yaita, who was the US trade representative, and uh, told him that this is what I intended to do. And uh, certainly he gave us encouragement uh, to do it. But the idea certainly did not come from him. The Cairns Group idea was a success, but the subsidy war continued. Australian farmers were willing to argue for desperate measures. They wanted to close the US-Australia defence joint facilities. It was not a good idea to link those things, and that was our point, and, the, uh, and basically that held. And I think it was wise if the bases are there for a purpose that serves Australian as well as U.S. interests, then why would you want to take away something that you view in your own interests? I think that's the basic way we tried to put it, and I think basically that was the reality. And uh, I said, You've therefore got to understand that this is something that goes beyond just the uh, question of, uh, of trade, uh, but uh, if it goes on without any indication of understanding on your point and preparedness to accommodate, at least to some extent, then it has the possibility of, uh, of undermining the, the basis uh, of support in Australia for the Alliance. By early 1989, it was abundantly clear that Australia's pressure on America would not bear fruit. That January, Hawke made a major gesture to Asia that came to represent a foreign and trade policy triumph. In Seoul, South Korea, Hawke proposed the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum to foster closer links in the region. I believe that the time has come for us substantially to increase our efforts towards building regional cooperation and seriously to investigate what areas it might focus on and what forms it might take. But it was done with what the United States felt was a passing swipe at them. When Mr Hawke first announced the concept, the United States was not included. Secretary of State Baker was quite clearly irritated that uh, such a proposal, which did not include America, uh, or even it did include America, had been announced without any prior consultation. So uh, th there was a problem with the United States. Candidly, we were concerned when the uh, idea was first broached that it seemed to be um, a concept that was drawing a line down the Pacific and separating uh, the Western Pacific from the Eastern Pacific. One of my tasks as the Special Envoy was to ascertain the views of the other uh, North Asia and uh, Southeast Asian countries on American participation uh, on the basis of uh, what the other countries uh, thought. Uh, Mr. Hawke decided quite quickly that uh, the United States um, uh, should be involved. Shortly after this, the um, uh, Indonesian foreign minister was visiting Australia and uh, uh, he inquired why the United States had been left out of the initial, um, initial list of countries proposed and then uh, re-included. Mr Hawke explained the background, that, you know, if you've got a, uh, uh, a difficult uh, person on a camping trip with you, it's better to have him uh, inside the tent pissing out than outside the tent pissing in. Well, APEC was one of Bob Hawke's really great achievements, I think, in government. People have been talking about Asia-Pacific economic cooperation for the last two and a half decades. Statesmen had been making statesmanlike speeches, but nobody had really followed the thing through.
foreign affairs enthralled Hawke. He reveled in it, was good at it, and was respected in overseas capitals. We born great sacrifices as brothers in war, and now we share great responsibilities as brothers in peace. And in this century, Australia has, has risen in stature from a dominion of England to become a nation, a great nation in culture and in the arts. The world has taken note. Australia, the rising star. The glory of Hawke's foreign affairs achievements escaped most Australians, though. The country was collapsing under the burden of interest rates. The building boom went bust and left acres of waste in its wake. I, I attended a meeting in late, late uh, 89 in Canberra, uh, the opening of the Zionist Federation building. I remember uh, one uh, prominent businessman telling me there, there are only two people in this room who believe you'll win the next election, me and my wife. I said, we're not sure. And I said, well, why is that? He said, well, everybody in this room is, is starting to do it hard. And he pointed at people around the room who were having severe financial problems with their businesses. I did tell uh, somebody in the uh, treasurer's office that I'd had that experience. And he said, uh, well, why doesn't somebody tell us these things? I said, I'm telling you now. <laughs> That's why I'm here. So all used to say to me, look, we're gone. We can't win the 1990 election with high interest rates. And I used to say, at one press conference after another, at one party discussion after that, That's not true. If you are the government and you look like the government and you've got the policies that the others don't have, the public will invest in you again. This morning I called upon the uh, Governor-General and recommended that the House of Representatives be dissolved with a view to an election for the House of Representatives and half the Senate being held on Saturday the 24th of March. And for the... Hawke to win his fourth election, Labor needed a spectacular political strategy. Once again, the environment would provide salvation, this time with a novel twist. So to get Bob Hawke to accept that he was in real trouble, that under normal circumstances he wouldn't win and it was going to take something sensationally different, was asking a lot of him, but he copped it. If you care about the environment, if you care about the future of Australia, your preference choice must be Labor. Put the Liberals and Nationals last. Just think about your preference vote. He copped the view that we would only win if we could get a greater share of second preferences than we'd ever got in the past. That we should be advertising and making appeal and appeal to people who were not going to vote Labor. Its second preference strategy was, was the biggest single reason for the success of Labor's campaign. It, uh, it was able to convince enough people that they should give Labor their second or third preference ahead of the Liberals in an otherwise very difficult situation for, for the party. Good evening, Angela Pearman with ABC News. Australians have cast their votes in an election described by both leaders as the most important for 40 years. Late opinion polls suggest it'll be a cliffhanger. The election night on 1990 was uh, extremely tense um, and uh, we, uh, we were in a situation where we knew we were going to lose a lot of seats in Victoria and that happened as they were going over like nine pins. The government squeaked home with the help of the second preference strategy. Graham Richardson, a major contributor to two of Labor's election victories, now wanted to move on from the Environment Ministry. Hawke's insensitive response created a major rift between them. We'd be in office across the corridor and uh, it was uh, amusing in a sense to, uh, to see them come and go because Graham Richardson would arrive expecting to be Transport and Communications Minister and then he would leave thinking he was Defence Minister 
and then Hawke would have to call him back after about half an hour after having had a conversation with Robert Ray to tell him that he was no longer Defence Minister. And, uh, I mean, he's, I'm sure his staff had already bought the hard hats and whatever. But uh, So it was a rather curious arrangement where I think uh, Richardson was three different ministers in the, in the spate of half an hour and ended up with a ministry that he didn't want. And, uh, of course, out of that, uh, a lot of ill feeling developed. But there was worse. Richardson, one of the government's best political minds, was also offered the job of High Commissioner in London. For some reason, Hawke seemed to be trying to get him out of politics altogether. It was a stupid blunder that misread Richardson completely and drove Hawke's chief backer into the arms of Keating. For someone who uh, had been close to Hawke for a very long time, as in very close to Hawke, for a very long time, who had uh, bled for him too often, uh, I thought that was a bit rich. And uh, to say that I was unhappy understates it. I think from that moment on, he thought he couldn't rely upon Bob's support, or enthusiastic support. And this did change, I think, the psychology of his friendship with him. It, it had an obvious, immediate and permanent impact on the relationship with Hawke. As he knew it must have been uh, going to do, and uh, as I did. And I think he, uh, he imagined, uh, he perhaps imagined things in regard to uh, uh, a post outside of government which simply had no foundation in fact. His disappointment uh, in not getting transport and communications and getting social security uh, did rankle with him and uh, it probably did have a continuing adverse impact upon what had been a close relationship. Out in the real world, the signs of a major recession were becoming even more obvious, though not to Hawke or Keating. Interest rates had started to decline in January 1990, but it was too little, too late. First time I saw Bob after he won the election, I think I said that. I just got a great feeling this is going to be hard, Bob. This is going to be much harder uh, than, than we've thought. This economy's going to dip much greater than we think. And that the forecast you have are wrong. So I felt very isolated in, in that period. I, uh, uh, I, think, uh, I think nobody wanted to hear what I was saying or believe what I was saying. I mean, this is not in any self-justification. I mean, I think the difference was I was hearing constantly from business and unions and others about the problems that they were encountering. And uh, I once recall talking to a business leader about it. I said, why don't you go and tell the Prime Minister and, the, uh, and others? He said, they're not listening. They won't listen. They're deaf, he said. It did worry me that, that people were not listening uh, either in the bureaucracy or, or even at a political level to in fact was what was very obviously the case by the last quarter of 1990 that if the brakes were not released it wasn't a matter of the economy slowing down, it was a matter of the economy collapsing. And that was patently obvious if you were representing an area like uh, Holt centre on Dandenong, that was the area which did knock the stuffing out of you. If you look through the period of 10 years of government, and you said, well, when did you really become, for the first time, depressed about the direction it was going? It was when, in fact, we ran into trouble on the employment side. Unemployment has jumped to its highest level for 12 months. Rate of six months. Its rate of unemployment has hit a 12-month high. They have confirmed the extent of Australia's economic downturn. Unemployment has jumped to its highest level for more than two years, while the outlook for manufacturing industry is the worst in the recession. An extra 10,000 Australians on the dog queue, according to the Department of Social Security. An extra 27,000 Australians out of work. I don't think there was that degree of understanding in government. Some ministers, but not enough, and certainly not uh, within the Prime Minister's office. Um, and for that matter, the Treasurer's. 
so I think I think that was probably if you looked at a period where the government policy was wrong and damaging, that was the period. The proper conduct of economic policy uh, really involves, I think, being prepared to listen to anecdotal evidence. Um, but you've also got to know that, particularly in these times, it's not as though here is a difficult situation and there is an easy alternative. Uh, Bob Hawke would laugh sometimes and say, well, you know, you were a gloomy bastard. Uh, and things like that when we were having a talk, privately perhaps, but... Uh, or he would say, I've heard something different. Uh, in Cabinet, uh, one or two times, he was pretty uh, hostile to what I said. Pretty hostile. Now, none of that is said in terms of saying that we handle it perfectly. We didn't. The government's forecasters, the Treasury, the Reserve Bank, the Department of Finance, etc., were saying, look, don't worry, we're not going to lose any production, we're just going to cut demand away, it'll work out as planned. Well, it didn't. So governments, in the end, can act intuitively, can act on advice, can act on a combination of intuition and advice, but when all of its forecasters, the statistician, the Reserve Bank, the Treasury, the Department of Finance, the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, all come together and tell you, look, by our best reckoning, this is where you'll be. Who are you to say, oh, that's wrong? You would be treated very dismissively in respect of what was referred to anecdotal evidence. That, in fact, was far better informed than anything, anything we were getting out of Treasury, Finance or Prime Minister and Cabinet. And that, I think, when you look back, uh, is very, very worrying that in fact we were acting on information that was just wrong and worse than that, there were people in that government who were saying that. All I can say is that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the final recommendations as to where we should go, as in all areas of economic policy, came through Paul as uh, Treasurer and uh, through him to, um, to me and to the Cabinet. And um, it was the recommendations, ultimately the recommendations, uh, of uh, the Treasurer that were given effect to. Struth! Take a look at that, will you? The economy seems to be losing altitude. It's nothing for us ordinary folk to worry about. You reckon they know what they're doing? Relax, they're experts. Ah, Paul, I thought these damn fool things were supposed to go up. We keep filling the thing with hot air. Don't get your glands in a knot, Bob. It'll be a soft landing. It'll be, it'll be a soft landing because we're seeing in last week's figures that great switch in the economy from domestic consumption, domestic production for consumption to export. So we're going to see our factories working and our employees employed producing goods but which will be consumed abroad instead of being consumed in Australia. I think that takes you back to what I regard probably as Paul's greatest weakness as a politician, which is the flip side of his brilliance as an advocate, that he passionately believes in what he's saying no matter what it is. And that leads him into the, the hazards of self-delusion. And I think when he was saying through 1990, right up until the end of 1990, that we were going to have a soft landing, that uh, that's the explanation for it, I believe. In November 1990, Keating finally made a grudging admission that would continue to haunt him for years. Well, I'll just give you a few comments on the national accounts. Like the first thing to say is that the accounts do show that Australia is in a recession. The most important thing about that is that this is a recession that Australia had to have. This is a recession that Australia had to have. This is a recession that Australia had to have. Now, because I believed that if we were going to have a recession, it would be such a, a relatively small one, because I heard the Treasury and everyone advising me that it would be either no recession or just, well, they, was, they said no recession, but if there was to be one, maybe it's the smallest recession. I thought if we're into it and out of it, 
the change, by and large, is going to be beneficial to Australia. <laughs> when I heard <laughs> that Paul had made the statement, this is the recession we had to have, I mean, frankly, I was... I, well, I was going to say I, I found it incredible, but um, with Paul, um, <laughs> the words so often flowed out, so often very good words and very effective words, <laughs> but at times uh, so silly. And I said, uh, uh, I forget who it was I was talking to, I said, those words will be an albatross around his neck for the rest of his career. Um, it was just very, very stupid. And for an intelligent man, which Paul is, he is an intelligent man, and in so many ways politic politically acute, uh, that was uh, the act and those were the words of someone in the political kindergarten. But anyway, it was a, it, uh, I'd thought about it before I used it, and I, I, I put a press statement out with it in, and I went round to see Bob and I said to him, what do you think of this? I mean, you know, it, it's really saying, look, a slowdown's good for us, and we need it. Now, we've been saying that, I said to him, but, you know, if it's a recession, and today it's the recession because we're two quarters of negative growth, do I say that's a recession we had to have? I said, that's what I'm inclined to say, but what do you think? He said, oh, well, OK. Any claim that I was uh, consulted about that phrase beforehand is an absolute lie. By the last part of 1990, the Hawke-Keating team was disintegrating. Keating's preoccupation with becoming Prime Minister was about to surface dramatically and destroy the government's unity. 1990, I remember Paul devoted a hell of a lot of his time to this argument about the telecom. Now, it, it was pretty frustrating, because I felt the economy was going a bit worse. People got, had been saying, I was trying to get him to focus on other things other than telecom. I was pushing my little favourite story about industry policy and a bit of industry support. Uh, but he spent most of his time talking about telecom, and so did the government. So I think in some sense, 1990 was a bit of a lost opportunity. Situation can change. The argument over competition in telecommunications was frenzied. Keating wanted a more competitive structure than the Minister Kim Beasley. This was no ordinary political fight. It was a reflection of Keating's frustration at not being Prime Minister. He had the capacity to make, uh, to make ministers cower before him and he used it very well. And he gave Beasley a terrible thing. And, uh, and Kim who's one of the nicest people I've ever known, doesn't know how to handle that, really. To this day, he doesn't know how to handle it. And, and uh, at the time, was saying, you know, oh, God, I can't stand this anymore, I'll walk away. And I think Kim was really finding it very, very difficult because Paul was really barreling into him at a 1,000 miles an hour. And it's a fearsome thing to have happen to you. I mean, when Paul goes for you, you know all about what's happening to you. I was a bit manic about it probably a bit too manic. No, I wouldn't have described his behaviour as manic. I, uh, I thought that he was... Um, I, mean, I found it quite impressive. You know, it was a, it was a, he was a very difficult bloke to handle. And, uh, I mean, he was terribly concerned about the appearance of the government and the, uh, uh, and the directions which we ought to, um, uh, ought to go. And I respected that. I didn't much like being the object of it at the time. His life was being made almost impossible by the, uh, the intense personal way in which uh, Paul Keating was interfering uh, and uh, making it a, a personal issue between them almost. It certainly was the case that uh, on this more than just about anything else, uh, Paul became um, extremely agitated for some, uh, he can bruise not just the ego, but the spirit. And that's when he goes too far. But he, he, and he occasionally does. The cabinet meeting that endorsed Beasley's approach was bitter. The call was getting more, was doing a very slow burn as the summing up was done. 
that uh, the Beasley model was going to get up. So Paul decided he'd had enough. He threw a pencil at Kim and stormed out of the room. I chucked a couple of uh, insults at him when he went. Earlier on, uh, Paul had uh, made the very strong point to someone in Cabinet not to spit the dummy, so I sort of repeated his own words to him as he left the room, and I regretted it afterwards because it was just being crass by me. When you reflect back, of course, to, to all of that, you, you now know um, a lot more things about uh, that period. That is, what was on his mind. I mean, at that stage, he thought he should be, uh, obviously thought he should have been leader of the party. They had solemnly agreed back in 88 that uh, Bob and Paul would go to the 90 election, but then afterwards um, Bob would um, hand over to Paul. So this was the sort of key issue between them, but it was also the key issue in Paul's life. So he always hoped, I guess, half expected that Bob would actually raise the subject with him because it was, it was a key issue. But the Prime Minister had not raised it. Hawke was enjoying being Prime Minister too much. One prep child was so excited he became a little mixed up and told his mother that God was coming on the <laughs> He was reluctant to acknowledge the secret agreement he had made with Keating in 1988. Under this agreement, Hawke would hand over leadership to Keating after the 1990 election. Keating wanted to know what was going on. Yeah, I mean, had there been the integrity, I think there should have been. I mean, once the 1990 election was over, he would have said to me, look, you know, in, you know, in October or November, look, I'll be putting the queue in the rack and, you know, I'll pick the date and I'll tell you this and you do this. But there was none of that. There was no good feel to it. Again, he said he was frustrated about the, the question of uh, the leadership. And uh, in that uh, discussion, it, for me, it occurred in a, in a, at a time where I was more and more convinced that um, the, uh, of the difficulties that were associated with, with Paul's uh, attitudes and what sort of a leader he'd be and how acceptable it would be. But I hadn't, at that point, um, made a decision to uh, walk away from Kirribilli. And I knew then I was just going to be a sort of basically a handmaid. And he thought my role in life was to sort of basically keep him looking like a, you know, alert, alive Prime Minister. Well, for many years it was, but then it became a joke. Went too long. It's then that I decided he was pulling the leg. stage, some performances will be better than others, but they'll always be up there trying to spring the economics and the politics together. Out there on the stage doing the Placido Domingo. <laughs> on December 7th, 1990, Keating had an engagement at Canberra's National Press Club. What became known as his Placido Domingo speech was an off-the-record Christmas address to the Canberra Press Gallery. The death of what had been perhaps Australia's most successful ever political partnership was imminent. Paul obviously hadn't given a great deal of thought to, to what he might say that night, and he was tossing a few ideas around. Now, he used to sometimes, I think, tease us with a couple of ideas about a few outrageous things he might say from time to time. On this occasion, he said, now, what's I say this about leadership isn't about tripping over uh, television cords in shopping centres, which was code for um, Bob, uh, Bob's leadership style isn't what leadership's about. I oh, said, oh, no, don't say that, don't say that. Now, normally, Paul would, if you sort of suggested something wasn't particularly suitable, he'd sort of drop it out and you'd never hear from it again. Leadership is not about being popular. It's not about being popular, it's about being right and about being strong. And it's not whether you go through some shopping centre, tripping over the TV crew's cords, 
It's about doing what you think the nation requires. Well, I could have been more choosy with my words, but it wasn't an attack. I didn't go there to attack all. In fact, I wrote the speech on the back of a coaster, sitting at the table with Michelle Grattan, who was chairing the thing, because I wasn't sure what I'd say. But Chris Higgins, the Secretary of the Treasury, had died the night before. I was very maudlin, exceptionally maudlin about it. I thought, well, here's a life dedicated to the public, public life of Australia, and I'm going to give a little speech, and I'm going to give you something of value about the same sort of dedication that he, he had, you know, and I, that was in my mind. I think there's no doubt he was attempting to precipitate something with that speech. I mean, he, was, he, he, he knew um, that um, the statements he was making were contentious. Now, it's, it's never as direct as saying you want exactly that outcome. I think what he was looking for is for the journalists in the gallery, for them to be thinking harder about the, the role of leadership and to be more focused on it. They're different things from altogether from saying that he wanted to have the Sunday newspapers screaming about it. Uh, but of course, it's an imprecise business, and so sometimes you can not quite hit the target you're hitting. Politics and politicians are about leadership. And our problem is, if you look at some of the great countries or the great societies like the United States, our problem is we've never had one leader like they have had. The explosive nature of Keating's speech caused some journalists to circumvent the ban on reporting it. By Sunday, it was everywhere. I just, all I've got to say to you is this, that... Uh, I expect to be seeing uh, Mr Keating late, uh, late later day in Canberra, and that's all I've got to say at this stage. Is it time to to A confrontation with Hawke was inevitable. Good morning. The Prime Minister is under pressure this morning to tackle his deputy Paul Keating over the Treasurer's blistering attack on Australia's leadership. Speaking off the record to journalists in Canberra, Mr Keating effectively indicated that Mr Paul... The Prime Minister's staff watched it. They could not hear it on a closed circuit TV. And it was an interesting contrast, I think, in the, in the, in the personal styles of the two men. Uh, Hawke sat back rather relaxed, he would occasionally reach for a cigar but uh, pretty much uh, said nothing. Whereas uh, Paul Keating was very animated, uh, he was throwing his arms around, every now and again he would get up and pace the floor. And I think too it was probably a, not only a reflection of their styles but a reflection of, uh, of who felt most aggrieved by all of this. I was uh, extremely annoyed. Um, annoyed for a number of reasons some which obviously included myself, uh, but uh, also in terms of how it was quite clear that this man's uh, naked ambition uh, was and, and arrogance was leading him to a total perversion of the history of the Labor movement. To say that uh, Australia hadn't had any great leaders was an incredible uh, reflection upon Keating. Hawke's bitter resentment at what Keating said at the National Press Club emerged in a curious way, in an argument about history. The mouth was the mouth of Paul Keating, but the words were the words of Jack Lang. So Bob took this umbrage about how he's the historian sitting back telling me about Curtin and all this stuff about Lang. The most controversial Premier Australia has ever seen. Twice Premier. The first time voted out of office by the people. The second time dismissed by the Governor, Sir Philip Game. Lang had become the sworn enemy of many in the Federal Labor Party. During the Depression, his followers in Canberra crossed the floor of Parliament and brought down the government. The cabinet to die directed the war cabinet. On the other hand, John Curtin was a Labor hero. He was Prime Minister during the Second World War and battled Lang's wrecking tactics for years. 
In later life, Lang became a mentor of Keating's. It was a joke that uh, you should have this protege of Lang, this uh, apologist for Lang, as it were, um, after the death of Lang still carrying on this feud uh, indirectly, as it were, by denigrating, albeit implicitly, uh, Curtin. I mean, it was a reflection, a very significant reflection on the nature of Paul Keating, I thought. Bob could take some lessons from Lang. Lang finished his political life with not an ounce of bitterness in him. I never heard him ever refer to anyone disparagingly. And he always had a kind word for Curtin, always. It was inexcusable, um, either in terms of facts and history, or in terms of any sense of responsibility um, of a uh, deputy um, to his uh, leader. And um, nothing out of that conversation did anything at all to change the increasingly strong feeling I had uh, that uh, Paul wasn't ready for leadership. Well, this is all just fiction. This is all made up by Bob as part of this sort of, you know, apology he makes for the fact that he used quite manipulatively the speech to try and say that he couldn't give me the leadership of the Labor Party, which he promised to do. You know, I mean, let's call a spade a spade here. I made it quite clear uh, that, uh, as far as I was concerned, the, uh, the question of what had been agreed before was uh, very much in uh, question. Okay. I now make it clear uh, that uh, I will lead the party to the next election and with the intention in of... In this uh, press conference after the discussion with Keating, Hawke signalled that the secret Kirribilli deal was off. While the deal was not publicly known, there were suspicions that something had been arranged between the two. Newspaper reporter Amanda Buckley gave voice to those concerns. Is there not a danger that the Australian people will think that you've done a secret deal with Mr Keating and in fact you're not going to serve through the next term? In life and in politics, uh, you will never be believed by everyone, including, may I say, may I dare say it, including some people in this particularly cynical group. You'll never be believed. You'll always harbour in your mind some doubt that we're, we've got a hidden agenda. Well, let me look you straight in your eyes and say, believe me, Amanda, believe me, because it's... <laughs> well, is that, is, that, is that an invitation? Those things are behind me, Amanda. Hawke and Keating would meet again in January. The bitterness simmered over Christmas. The meeting in late January, 31st of January, um, was the crucial meeting. It was a meeting in which Hawke finally admitted to Keating's face that he would renege, was prepared to renege on the Kirribilli arrangement. By this stage, my, my view of the unacceptable nature of what Paul Keating had said and his activities more generally um, and what I regarded as his lack of readiness at this stage uh, for the leadership had been strengthened in my own mind and so I made it clear that that was the way I was thinking. Uh, I said, look, I require nothing of you other than you keep your word. This was an unqualified agreement. Your, the, the thing, the honourable thing for you to do is to keep your word and get out the road. Hawke claims that he was shocked during the meeting by unpatriotic comments Keating had made that Keating had disparaged Australia. As he sort of despaired in a sense of perhaps ever becoming Prime Minister if he didn't have his turn now, um, he um, speculated that uh, he would go and that uh, um, his going might not just be from Parliament and the politics, it may be from the from country even. And he made some 
very remarkable comments in that uh, context, but uh, I think perhaps you'll have to wait for the memoirs to uh, see that uh, in all its glory. Hawk quite often uh, made, the, made the point to me in, in conversation that if Keating was ever to become uh, Prime Minister of Australia, you'd have this rather unique situation where you'd have uh, uh, the first couple who uh, neither liked Australia nor Australians. So that, that's the way he, he saw it. See, he's always felt he knew the Australian people better than anyone else. I mean, I, I've always disputed this claim. Bob had an easy ride through public life, shoehorned along by many other people, and thought it was all because of his great understanding about them. I don't think he did understand them. I mean, I'll back my, my loyalty to this country and my patriotism against Bob Hawke's any day. Hawke profoundly believed that his deep rapport with the Australian people meant only he could win the next election. It was a claim Keating was determined to contest. In 1991, Paul Keating would launch a challenge to Hawke's leadership that would turn that year into a disaster for both the government and the country. I knew that if I wasn't out of there by the middle of 1991, I would have to put the budget together in 1991, change all the policy, carry the burden of that change, sell it all, work, work myself into the ground, try and win another poll, and for which I'd be told afterwards he'd thank his ministers again, uh, and I would be left waiting another time until some of the people in the caucus decided it might be my time. So I said, hey, listen, I'm not here to, as handmaiden for you guys. You make your mind up. You know, I've done enough for you for long enough. Too much, in fact. <laughs> 